If a good or service is provided by nature, we'll call them ecosystem services. So we would say in this series, we're trying to quantify the value of ecosystem services. Okay, let's look at forests and classify the kinds of ecosystem services they offer. We could do this for any sort of ecosystem, but we're just going to look at forests to narrow our study. There are different ways of organizing and classifying the benefits. Under the system we're looking at, there are five classes of ecosystem services. First, there are direct benefits. Okay, it's when we get utility from using a substance directly, or when our willingness to pay for a thing comes from our value of that thing. So from a forest, harvesting the wood would be a direct benefit. Taking water would give a direct benefit. Getting animals from hunting or trapping would be direct benefits. Basically taking and using any substance from the forest would give a direct benefit. Okay, it's utility from using the thing directly. But walking on a hiking trail would also be a direct benefit. It doesn't have to use it up. It can be non-consumptive as long as it's still using it directly. The utility or benefit comes from direct interaction with that substance. So any recreation uses like hiking or fishing or camping or swimming or enjoying scenic views would be direct benefits. Similar to value from direct uses is value from indirect uses. For something we call a direct use, we are willing to pay for it because of the utility that thing gives us. With an indirect use, for example, some aspect like a wetland that improves water quality or the way the soil under a forest will allow infiltration, increasing the amount of water available, these ecosystem services are giving us utility indirectly through the other thing that we're using. So our willingness to pay for them really all depends on our use of this other thing. Another example, if if none of our crops required pollination, we would not value bees nearly as much as we do right now, even though the bees haven't changed. So for example, with a forest, a mangrove on the coast will help lessen the damage from storms, taking some of the impact from wind and water. This allows a lot of human productions to continue and save a lot of money and damages. Forests can help prevent erosion, mangroves helping prevent coastal erosion, keeping the land from falling into the sea. Preventing soil erosion protects water sources from pollutants, protecting fish habitats, among other things. The water Tension of the soil helps prevent flooding and helps keep water in place, lessening the harm from droughts when the rain stops and keeps rivers flowing. Trees can help reduce the temperature of a microclimate by constantly transferring the energy from the sun into water that evaporates away. Also, it makes shade. And right beside that, carbon is sequestered in the soil and the trees, which can help reduce the greenhouse effect. Forests can house natural pollinators that offer a vital service to farmers. And lastly, pharmaceutical companies often start with natural chemicals as the base from which to build more powerful drugs like aspirin and morphine. And farmers and genetic engineers will do a similar thing. So a diversity of plants and animals could represent an input into productions like these. And otherwise, there are a bunch of ecosystem services that seem to correlate with biodiversity that you can look up. With indirect environmental services, we don't always know the effects a creature will have. For example, in India, many people do not eat cows because they are considered sacred. But there's a lot of cows around. It's the vultures and other animals that eat the cows. In the 90s, the population of vultures dropped from millions to thousands. This ended up being attributed to an anti-inflammatory drug that was used to treat some livestock that just happened to be fatal to vultures. The uneaten carcasses were left to pollute some water supplies, and also the vulture's corner of the scavenging niche was filled by dogs and rats and other animals whose population flourished. But while the vulture's gut will kill any pathogens, the dog's and rat's guts don't and will become carriers for diseases from the corpse, or just other diseases. Dogs will bite a human, but vultures won't. The vultures were essentially offering a sanitary carcass disposal service. The point is, there are a lot of involved interactions between us and the world around us. With indirect benefits especially, we don't typically appreciate or even know about these things until they're gone. So direct uses and indirect uses are use values, where the ecosystem is doing something for us physically, and our willingness to pay for them reflects that. But there are also non-use values, where people's willingness to pay comes from less tangible aspects of the ecosystem. First up, bequest values. Which would you rather your children or the next generation inheriting a wetland or a parking lot. The bequest value isn't about which one offers the greater net present value, it's about which feels better to pass on. It's a non-use value. So in terms of forests, a local community, or maybe an aboriginal community especially, may place a high cultural value on the life that they have formed around the use of a forest. This is their entire culture and they want future generations to be able to continue this. The bequest value can come from passing on any aspect of the forest, depending on what the community values hunting, or logging, or whatever. Existence value is another non-use value. Existence value is the utility gained in the satisfaction in knowing something exists, like whales or the Grand Canyon or whatever. In terms of forests, the continued existence of, for example, the Amazon rainforest and the diversity of species it houses gives people value beyond any physical services they provide. Although it can be
be any local forest or species too. It's an intangible thing, but at the same time it does fuel real money transactions. For example, people giving money to charities that promise to save the whales or the rainforests or whatever. They're not giving as an investment for future vacations they may take. It's a willingness to pay to live in a world where the rainforest exists. Lastly, somewhere slightly between the world of use and non-use values, there are option values. Option values exist in some markets. For example, let's say you're offered this house at a specific price. You may not know if you want it or not for whatever reason, but it's a limited time offer. So you enter into an agreement with the owner that gives you the right to buy it in say three months if you want. They're not going to sell it to anyone else, but you're going to have to pay for the privilege. Whether or not you actually end up buying the house, you are willing to pay for this option. It's the value in having the option of using something in the future. In terms of a forest, this could be the option to use the forest for hiking, or hunting, or fishing, or even the option to use it for timber. Basically any value can be valued for the option of having it. So a number of people will have a willingness to pay to keep something around in case they choose to use it in the future, especially if the change that's coming is going to be permanent. In theory, all these values added up together makes the total economic value, and we can use that to compare that to whatever the competition is. But some of these will be kind of controversial, particularly the non-use values. And it's a lot of work to try to find the total economic value before and after whatever change, especially with a seemingly endless stream of indirect benefits. So instead, we have to look at the most important aspects to decision makers and try to only focus on the things that are going to change. In the next video, we'll look at how to pick the ecosystem service to focus your study on.